just to set the record straight, I married this lovely lady when she was four years old. So, everybody, let's, let's keep that straight. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here, and, and I want to thank my, my friend Morton for giving me the privilege. I, I look, I, I think this is just one of the greatest organizations in the conservative movement. I really do. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's not included in my bio, but I am a graduate of the Leadership Institute. I did come to Leadership Institute classes. In fact, I was telling Aaron, I actually stayed in the dormitory, Morton, actually lived here for several days. Uh, trying to learn under the tutelage of those you brought in to train us. Um, as a matter of fact, I was thinking ab about the many people that you've helped and, and, and developed and trained. And a lot of us, of course, have ended up going into politics. And I just found somebody else to blame when my wife looks at me crooked about being involved in politics. It's his fault. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I, I was thinking to myself, I ran for U.S. Senate. Some of you may not remember this, and I can understand why. Um, I ran for U.S. Senate having never run for office before and decided that this was the inspiration I had, that that's what I should do. And I did that, uh, I think that was 2000, 2011. Yeah, I ran to 2012 primary, got involved in 2011. I'd already taken some courses at the Leadership Institute. I was thinking there was one course that should have been added don't do it. <laughs> because when you run for office at a statewide level and you've never run before, you talk about drinking out of a fire hose. You have no idea what you're getting into, and I didn't. But what little I was able to accomplish, because it, frankly it laid the groundwork for me winning the nomination for lieutenant governor, what little groundwork I was able to lay, I laid because I'd learned some things at the Leadership Institute. Uh, and so I will always be grateful to Morton and to this great organization. Now, he's asked me to address a couple of things. I'm gonna talk about one of them. Uh, I've only got a few minutes. I was told don't keep him any longer than about an hour and a half. Um, well, you know, as a preacher, that's a short sermon, folks. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, five to seven minutes about one subject. Then I'm going to talk about a subject that's uh, also near and dear to my heart. I wanted to reflect a little bit about where we are on health care first. And, and I'm sure all of you are quite concerned about this, uh, or you should be. Because after hearing for seven years that we were going to repeal and replace Obamacare, um, we got a Republican Congress, and they couldn't quite do it. And then we got a Republican Senate, and of course they couldn't do it over the veto of President Obama. And then we, now we have the, the, the House, we have the Senate, and we have the White House, and it still appears that we're having a difficult time doing it. And of course, for those of us who are outside the Beltway, you sort of scratch your head and you think, haven't they had plenty of time to sort of resolve all of this stuff and get it all together? Uh, just my reflections, and, and later on you can make your comments and ask me questions about this. I, I don't think we have a substance problem. I think we've got a process problem. And I think the process problem began with Speaker Ryan, who I, I think has got some, some major issues. Uh, I, I think that he miscalculated in terms of, of how to roll this out. And I think by freezing out members of the Freedom Caucus and some, and some others, even those on the more moderate side, by, by freezing them out and, uh, and not giving them an opportunity to weigh in, uh, I think he set the situation up for failure because it made them all mad. Uh, I know Jim Jordan personally, he's the founder of the Freedom Caucus, and. He was on a conference call. I do a conference call every Tuesday at noon. Uh, and I chose Tuesdays, Morton, so that I wouldn't interfere with the Paul Weirich luncheon, by the way. Uh, but we do it Tuesdays at noon. And uh, I have various guests from around the country. We had Jim Jordan on a couple weeks ago to talk about this whole issue of you know, what's going to happen with the health care bill. And he made clear that his problem was primarily not with the president, that his problem was primarily with Speaker Ryan that he thought the leadership had not opened the process up sufficiently to produce a product that we could all rally around. Uh, so that, I think that upset them. And I think that the, the moderates felt the same way. Uh, of course, the Freedom Caucus has a number of issues, but it seems to me the, uh, the primary one is this whole essential benefits issue. 
Uh, they don't like the government sort of dictating to insurance companies the services that they should provide. And you all know the, the famous one, maternity care. You know, what is, what is uh, you know, two people in their late 50s, early 60s, what do they need with maternity care? Well, of course, you know, there are miracles, I guess. Um, <laughs> And, and, and what do they need with pediatric care? So uh, they're concerned about that, and I think that issue can be resolved. But of course, after the debacle, after, can you, and by the way, you know I have this picture in my head, and, and by the way, you know, look, I think, I, I prefer Paul Ryan uh, running the house any day of the week over Nancy Pelosi. So let's just make clear where I stand. But I mean, I just have this picture of him, you know, squirreling over to the White House to tell the president, we don't have the votes. And I have to believe that could not have been a very pleasant meeting. So the thing went down. And then the president, which he is wont to do, started to, you know, issue little, his little barbs against the Freedom Caucus. Well, needless to say, you know, well, the man, he's, he's dangerous with a tweet, isn't he? Um, but needless to say, that didn't go over well with the Freedom Caucus, and that made them mad. There's some hard feelings about that, and I'm sure you all know that Vice President Pence, who I think is a, truly a healing, calming influence in the administration, uh, apparently met with members of the Freedom Caucus on Monday night and apologized for that and smoothed over a lot of rough feelings. And, and so that's why I say I think we got a process problem. Uh, the moderates, of course, are concerned about the potential of 24 million people, I think, by 2024 not being covered. And I, I think that's an issue that can be resolved as well if they can ever get past, you know, sort of the, the way this whole thing has unfolded. Freedom Caucus being upset with uh, Speaker Ryan and then all of them being upset with the president or the Freedom Caucus being upset with the president about attacking them. Uh, but I, I am very hopeful. Uh, I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm very hopeful that there is going to be uh, a repeal and replacement of Obamacare. And I'll tell you why I believe that. Because they just better do it. They just better do it. I, I mean, folks, I mean, think about this. It would be a disaster of monumental proportions if Obamacare is not repealed and replaced. I mean, I think the Republicans would pay an awful price, not just next year, but maybe two years from then, if they don't do something with this. I hope that they realize it would be virtually suicidal not to do something about health care. So I think, I think something is going to happen, and I think they're in the process now of smoothing over the hard feelings. And ultimately, I think they'll get to a result. We'll probably see a lot of people not covered, but not as many uh, as under the original bill. And we'll probably see some of those uh, essential benefits that are now still under what they're calling Obamacare light. We'll probably see some of those eliminated and probably see some additional uh, free market things put into the bill to make the Freedom Caucus feel better. Let me just say something about the Freedom Caucus real quick. Because I think some people are angry with the Freedom Caucus, too. A lot of Trump supporters are upset with them, thinking, you know, come on, this is, this is our president. Why are we fighting him? But you have to keep something in mind. There's a whole new dynamic in the House now. In fact, I really believe that Speaker Ryan may be the weakest speaker we've seen in a generation. And I think it's in part because these folks were sent by, there by a constituency to do a job. And they understand that if they go home to their constituency and they have not held fast, the likelihood of their getting reelected, it, it may be slim to none. The likelihood of their getting primaried is gonna be very high. Uh, I know Dave Bratt, in fact, Dave Bratt is having a breakfast this morning that I was invited to, but I told him I had a more important engagement with Morton Blackwell, Morton, so just so you know. Uh, but Dave Bratt, as you all know, toppled Eric Cantor with the promise that he was going to go and not do the bidding of the leadership, but he was going to go to Congress and do the bidding of his constituents. These folks are not playing games because they know that their political lives depend upon their doing what they said they were going to do. 
Uh, I don't think they're out to hurt the president. I think they're just out to, to do what they promised their constituencies they were going to do. So I, I think that, that this thing will get worked out somehow. Uh, I'm hoping that it will get worked out quickly so we can put it behind us uh, and we can move on to other things that the president wants to do. Uh, so I'll be happy later on to take some, any questions or comments about that issue. Let me talk to you then briefly about an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm sure all of you know who Thomas Sowell is. Um, I just finished reading uh, his book, um, uh, Wealth, Poverty, and Politics. Uh, if you've never read that book, you got to get that book. Uh, I'm a reader. It is one of the greatest books I have ever read. Now, just like your grandchild compared to your Lily's Morton, I wouldn't compare it to the Bible, folks. Uh, but it, it, is, it is a great book. I mean, it is a great book. Uh, it, it's, of course, it's about comparing uh, societies and cultures and demographics and geography internationally, but some great insights come out of it. But it reinforced an, an, an idea that I have about one of the most intractable, problem, uh, intractable problems we have in America, which is the problem of inner city violence, chaos, family breakdown, and these things that have been persistent over more than a generation now, and, and by the way, seem to, generally speaking, be getting worse, not better. I mean, we're not getting more family formation. We seem to be getting less. We're not getting the numbers improving. They seem to be getting worse. Uh, in a city like Richmond, for example, where the average uh, out of wedlock birth rate in the black community is 72%, in Richmond it's 80%. Uh, and you all know that half of the babies uh, to black women in New York are aborted. So we, we've got the gang warfare, the murders, the, 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 the just, I think the president described it right when he said carnage. There is carnage going on. And I've traveled all over the country and everywhere I go, people express to me their despair over these issues ever being resolved. And I think that I've got a solution. I don't, probably not unique to me, but, but I've got one I wanna share it with you before I start taking your questions. I went to Milwaukee. Uh, we have a program under my organization, STAND. If you wanna find out more about it, you can go to standamerica.us. Uh, but one of the projects we have is something called STAND with law enforcement. And as part of that, I traveled all over the country every time there was some sort of racial incident uh, to meet with police officers, to meet with members of the community, to talk to them about what was going on. So I went to Milwaukee after the death of, I think it was Aaron Sperling, and uh, talked to police out there and, and talked to community members out there. I had a man come up to me and say this. He said, I was here 50 years ago when there were riots in Milwaukee over the same issues. He said, and here we are 50 years later having riots in Milwaukee over the same issues. And I submit this, if we don't do something different than what we've done, 50 years from now, we will be experiencing exactly the same thing and lamenting the murders and the chaos and the family breakdown and all of these terrible social consequences of what I think began in the 60s, the moment government stepped in to Ronald Reagan, put it, to help. Uh, man, with help like that, we don't, need, you know, we don't need anybody trying to tear things up because they really tore things up. And you know, this myth that, well, you know, the, the black community is broken down as a result of slavery. Folks, for 100 years after slavery, the black family was intact. In 1960, 75% of black children were born in wedlock. And by 1970, that situation had taken a precipitous and dramatic turn. So we know that what began to happen in the, in the 60s drove this. Well, I believe, and this is where Thomas Sowell comes in, one of the things he argues is that, you know, societies and nations prosper for a whole variety of reasons. And, and one of those reasons sometimes is the geography. And he talks about the difference, for example, between the geography of America and the geography of Africa. That America is one of these nations where we have many ports and we have uh, 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 low um, uh, uh, coasts where ships can come in close. We can bring goods in very easily to our coast. Africa's different. Africa doesn't have many of those at all. 
the, the altitude uh, um, of, of, uh, of the, the land mass of Africa is very high, 1,000 to 2,000 feet high. Very few places to dock in that country. This talks about how much more difficult that makes it for transportation and an exchange of information and goods and so forth. And he compares, you know, Africa to China to, to Australia, and he gives all of these indices. But this is where he lands. He says, in effect, though, all of these things can be overcome by culture. He said, if the culture of a country is productive, is innovative, value certain things, they will overcome their demographics and they will overcome their geography. So he talks about mountainous people, for example, being very isolated and tend to be backward because of their isolation. So this is true not only in America, it's true all over the world. He said, but there are some mountainous communities that develop certain skills and abilities that allow them to interact with people in the lowlands and to prosper even though the general rule is they don't. Here's my point. I believe that we ultimately don't have an economic problem in the inner city and, and we ultimately don't have a political problem. We've got a cultural problem. You know, I'm convinced that government is unable to instill positive cultural values, but it can certainly destroy them. And that that is what has happened. I was raised uh, in foster care for the first 10 years of my life. Uh, my dad took me out of foster care. And in fact, I've got an article that's coming out today, I think, in American Thinker. And I talked about the fact that what my dad did to me when he took me out of foster care at 10 years old as from a little young budding gangster and a petty thief and doing all kinds of stuff that I had no business doing yet at the age of 10 was he changed my culture. He changed the vision and view that I had of life um, and, and instilled in me certain fundamental ideas. Um, one of the things that he instilled in me was the self, an idea of self-worth, that you have something to offer, but you also have to take personal responsibility for yourself, for your development. Demanded that I do well in school. Demanded that I stay out of trouble. Demanded that I not hang out with the people I'd been hanging out with. One of whom, by the way, ended up going to jail for murder. Well, a friend of mine murdered another friend. That's the direction I was headed in. But my dad changed my culture. He changed the way I thought about life. And as a result, my trajectory shifted. And what we've been doing with the inner cities is we've been trying to parachute in with government programs and with money and with welfare without realizing that often what we're doing is undermining the very ideas and principles that cause a community to prosper. When you teach dependence rather than independence, when you teach the government will do it, when you teach you're not really responsible for your own life, it's somebody else's fault. What you're really instilling people is a sense of hopelessness and despair. And that all you can do is what you're doing. And so you make the best of it you can. And folks, this is not academic for me. I grew up in the ghetto. My, my church uh, my church is, I've got a couple of churches, but they've often served inner city people. And I've had young people say to me, well, we deal drugs because the white man won't let us do anything else. Now, they didn't learn that. They didn't come up with that that is by themselves. They learned that from people like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and, and others who exploit the issue of race because you have to remember, both government and people in these kinds of positions don't benefit from people who think independently and act independently and are committed to bettering themselves. They benefit from people who remain in the same condition because that's their constituency and that's what gives them relevance as rescuers, as saviors. And so we've got a program called Project Awakening and it tries to, first of all, it's a program that absolutely excludes all government funding and all government help. We don't want it because we think it is the death knell of the success of helping anybody. But it's based on this idea of going in and transforming the culture. And, and it basically just three principles based upon this word, create, CR, cultural renewal. 
we need a cultural revolution in these communities. We need to do for these folks what was done for me. Give them a new way of thinking about life and thinking about issues. And then entrepreneurial awakening. You all realize, don't you, that before the 1960s, entrepreneurship had a major impact in the black community because there was no choice. I mean, Jim Crow segregation in the South made it, you had to build your own hotels, you had to have your own stores, you had to create your own business community because you were pretty much excluded. In fact, they often became so successful that they were attacked because they were taking business away from some of the white entrepreneurs and business people who realize, you know, these people are actually becoming self-sufficient and independent. So we need an entrepreneurial awakening. And I always say that the, the greatest entrepreneur in the inner city should not be the drug dealer. And unfortunately, that's, that's what is often the case right now. And then the last technical education. You know, uh, folks, I, I, I was a philosophy major. I became a philosophy major because I knew I was going to law school and I wanted to be challenged. If I was going to work after college, I wouldn't have been a philosophy major. I'd have probably studied engineering. Um, you know, we've got people studying in these universities some of the most dead-end nonsense imaginable that can't help you find a job, can't help you take care of your family, can't help you do anything. And, and, and folks, technical education, you can, you can begin to do that right out of high school. You can begin to earn a living right out of high school. No wonder we've got to keep young people on their parents' health care until they're 26. Because very often when they graduate from college, they, they, they don't have any skills that are marketable, any skills that are valuable in the workplace. And so we believe that there needs to be a partnership between churches and businesses and uh, private schools and other private institutions going in to bring a new cultural awakening into these communities and it starts at the church. Uh, so it's called Project Awakening. You'll find out more about it at standamerica.us because this is my commitment. I told you I married my wife when she was four. My wife always tells me, don't tell people how old you are because then they're gonna date me. <laughs> so since she's here, and I'll have to hear it if I tell you how old I am, uh, suffice to say, there's a legacy I want to be sure I leave, and one of the legacies I want to be sure I leave is I want to do things for young kids like what was done for me. You're looking at a guy who could have been in jail, who could have been drug addicted, likely would have been dead had not something very dramatic happened in my life. Now, I can't be every kid's father, but I believe that the principle of changing the culture, changing the outlook, and the ideas of people can actually change the trajectory of their lives. Uh, and that's what we're gonna try to do. So let me stop there and I'll be happy to take any questions.